I would lie a uh, story of success. Malcolm Gladwell. The 10,000 hours rule. 3. So, back to Bill Joy. It's uh, 1971. He's tall and quirky and 16 years old. He's a mess with the kind of student at school like MIT and Caltech and the University of Waterloo attracted by the hundreds. When Bill was a little kid, he wanted to know everything about everything way before he should do, even know he wanted to know. His father, William said, we answered him when we could and when he couldn't, we would just give him a book. When it came time to apply to college, Joy got a perfect score of on the mass portion of the scholastic aptitude test. It wasn't particularly hard, he said matter-of-factly. There was plenty of time to check it twice. He was talented by the truck road, but that's not the only consideration. And never is. The key with you his development is that he stumbled across the nondescript building on Bill Avenue. In the early 1970s, when Joy was learning about the program, computers were the size of rooms, a single machine which might have less power and memory than your microwave now has, could cost about a million dollars, and that's in 1970s dollars. Computers were rare. If you found one, if it was hard, it, it was hard to get access to it. If you managed to get access, anything time only cost a fortune. Much more, programming itself was extraordinarily tedious, tedious. This was the era when computer programs were created using carved punch card. Each line of code was imprinted on the card using a key punch machine. A couplex program might include hundreds, if not hundreds, of these cards in tall stocks. Once the program was ready, we, talk, we walked over the variable mainframe computer you had access to and gave a stock of cards to an operator. Since computers could handle only one task at a time, the operator made an appointment for many programs, your program, and depending on how many people were ahead of you in line, you might not get your card back for a few hours or even a day. If, and if you made even a single error, even a typographical error in your program, you had to take the cards back track down the error, and began the whole process again. Under those circumstances, it was exceedingly difficult to, for anyone to become a programming expert. Certainly, becoming an expert to your early 20s was all but impossible. And you can program for only a few minutes out of every hour you spend in the computer room. How can you even get in 10,000 hours of practice? Program with a card, one computer scientist from the era remembered, did not teach you program, it taught you patience and property. It wasn't until the 1960s that a solution to a program problem emerged. Computers were finally powerful enough for that they could handle more than one appointment at once. If the computer's operation system were rewritten, computer scientists realized the machine's time could be saved, the computer could be trained to handle hundreds of tasks at the same time. Then, that in turn meant that the programmer didn't have to physically hand their stock of computer cards to the operator anymore. Dozens of terminal could be built or linked to the mainframe by a telephone line. 
that everyone could be working online all at once. Here is how one history of the period described the advent the time theory. This was not just a revolution, it was a revelation. Forget the operate, the card decks, the weight. With the time sharing, you could see the your teletype, bang in a couple of comments, and get an answer then and there. Time sharing was interactive. A program could ask for a response, wait for you to type it in, act on it while you waited, and show you the result all in real time. That's where Michigan came in, because Michigan was one of the first universities in the world to switch over to time theory. By 1967, a prototype of a system was up and running. By the early 1970s, Michigan had enough computer power that a hundred people could be programming simultaneously in the computer center. In the later, late 60s, early 70s, I don't think there was any place where that was exactly like Michigan. Mike Alexander, one of the pioneers of Michigan's computing system, said, maybe MIT, maybe Carnegie and Mellon, maybe Dartmouth. I don't think there were any others. This was the opportunity that greeted Bill, Joy, and he arrived on an Ann Arbor campus in the fall of 1971. He hadn't chosen Michigan because of its computers. He had never done anything with computers in high school. He was interested in math and engineering, but when the program bug hit him in his freshman year, he found himself by the happiest of accident in one of the few places in the world where a 17 years old could program all he wanted. Do you know what, is, what the difference is between the computing cards and time theory? Joy said. It's the difference between playing chess by mail and speed chess. Program wasn't an exercise in frustration anymore. It was fun. I lived in the North Campus, and the computer, computer center was in the North Campus. Joe went to work. How much time did I spend there? A phenomenal amount of time. It was often 24 hours. I would stay there all night and just walk home in the morning. In an average week in those years, I was spending more time in computer center than on my classes. All of us down there had this recording nightmare of forgetting to show off for class at all, of not even realizing we were enrolled. The challenge was that they gave all the students an account with a fixed amount of money, so your time would run out. When you signed on, you would put it how long you wanted to spend on the computer. They gave you like an hour of time. That's all you do get. But someone figure out that if you put in time equals and then a letter like T equals K, they wouldn't charge you, he said, rapting at the memory. It was a verb in the software. You could put it in T equals K and sit there forever. Just look at the stream of opportunity that came Bill George way. Because he happened to go to a far-sighted school like the University of Michigan, he was able to practice on a time sharing system instead of with a punch card. Because the Michigan system happened to have a bug in it, he could program all he wanted because the university was willing to spend the money to keep the computer center open 24 hours. He could stay up all night, and because he was able to put in so many hours, by the time he happened to be presented with the opportunity to rewrite Unix, 
He was up to the task. Bill Joy was brilliant. He wanted to learn. That was a big part of it. But because before he could become an expert, someone had to give him an opportunity to learn how to be an expert. And Mr. Khan, I was probably program 8 or 10 hours a day. He went on. By the time I was at Berkeley, I was doing it day and night. I had a terminal at home. I stay up until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, watching all the movies and programming. Sometimes I'd fall asleep on the keyboard. He mimed, he mimed his head falling on the keyboard. And you know how the key repeat until the end, and it start to go beep, 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 beep. After that happened three times, you have to go to bed. It was still relatively incompetent even when I got to Berkeley. I was proficient by my second year there. That's when I wrote programs that are still in use today, 30 years later. He forged for a moment to do the mess in his head, which for someone like Bill Joy doesn't take very long. Mr. Khan in 1971, programming in earnest by sophomore year. Add in the num summers, then the day and night in his first year at Berkeley. So, so maybe 10,000 hours. He said, finally, that's about right.